All right, everyone. So um, we're going to get started. If you guys have any questions or having any problems with audio, uh, feel free to just type a message in the chat. Um, it won't interrupt anything, and we can kind of see things as we come in. Um, for those of you just joining us, uh, you know, you can add your questions as we go, and then at the end, we'll kind of go through them all, and um, you know, hopefully, have some time for discussion at the end. But um, as for the quick introduction, so this is Dr. Tracy Ray. He's a graduate of the Medical College of Georgia. He then went on to complete his residency in family medicine at the University of Alabama and his fellowship in primary care sports medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Ray is currently an associate professor at Duke University in the departments of community and family medicine and orthopedic surgery. He heads the primary care sports medicine fellowship program and is involved in Duke's medical student interest group. He's a former member of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine Board of Directors. And Dr. Ray, whenever you are ready, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, looking forward to this. I've not done one of these before, so we'll see how it goes. This is a this is a topic that's uh, uh, dear to my heart for the 20 years that I've been practicing, uh, taking care of uh, a number of baseball players in my career. And uh, we're going to fly at about 35,000 feet, but uh, we'll kind of try to include some of the biomechanics and some of the common injuries. Uh, so there are a lot of stresses that uh, happen with an overhead throw. Uh, we're going to look at some of that and then select out a few injuries that are kind of uh, particular to baseball um, and then go through kind of the workup and treatment. And then uh, we'll finish up with talking about a little bit of prevention, especially in young baseball players. So some of you may have seen this before. It's just uh, how we kind of break down the, the throwing phases uh, from wind up all the way to uh, release and follow through. Um, and all of these uh, phases in throwing are important with uh, asking athletes where they hurt, uh, in what phase. You can get a kind of a better idea of what tissue might be under stress and so on and so forth. So as we as we discuss wind up, uh, early cocking, late cocking, acceleration and follow through, this uh, should be helpful for you to just kind of keep those phases in mind. So if you think about the, the biomechanics and the kinematics of a rotating shoulder, uh, I think it's important to realize the stress across the shoulder is tremendous. At the time of release of the, the, uh, the ball from the hand, with an overhead throw, the shoulder is internally rotating at a peak velocity of about 7,500 degrees per second. And that's reportedly the fastest motion we know in sports. So, so how fast is 7,500 degrees per second? Well, if you took this uh, picture of this individual at the point at which he lets go of this ball and you recorded what his arm would do in the next full second, it would make 20 full revolutions. So that it gives you an idea of what kind of stress we're talking about going across the, the tissues and the structures of the shoulder. Um, at the elbow, uh, another area that's a real common area to be injured, uh, the biomechanics here show that in cadaveric studies, now this is with the muscles removed, uh, but if, if, if you're putting uh, uh, the same kind of stress that you see at 80 miles per hour with a fastball, which in today's game is, is not a very fast fastball, but the amount of stress across the ulnar collateral ligament is really kind of redlining that ligament in its capacity to, to maintain its integrity. Uh, anything above 80 and, and the, the ulnar collateral ligament begins to kind of break down uh, slowly but surely. Um, but also not just uh, stress and opening on the medial side of the elbow, but there's also the compression uh, on the lateral side of the elbow uh, where the distal humerus called the capitellum begins to compress very uh, strongly against the radial head. Um, and then a, th a third stress is happening kind of in the posterior elbow where the ulna uh, and the olecranon, the tip of the ulna, the olecranon moves into the olecranon fossa. And with the amount of torque that's on the, the elbow, 
the olecranon can kind of rub up against the medial wall of the fossa and, and really begin to cause some trouble there. So some of the injuries that we're going to look at is something called valgus extension overload syndrome uh, at the elbow. Um, we're going to talk about kids a little bit with uh, actually pulling away of the uh, medial epicondyle because of the strength of the musculature um, overcoming the 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 uh, the physis at the uh, medial epicondyle. Baseball players as ulnar collateral ligaments. We'll talk about that. Um, one injury that you may not have heard about is called internal impingement. And then we'll finish up with uh, talking about kids and something called little leaguer shoulder. Um, so when you're when you're going to go in and talk to a baseball player, there's a lot of different things to kind of uh, kind of important facts that you want to ask uh, about their pitching history uh, and any kind of pain that they've had. Um, it should include when they started pitching, uh, you know, as a youngster, were they were they in baseball from the time they were four or five? Uh, when did they actually enter into kid pitch? Uh, has anybody kind of kept up with their their uh, pitch counts, their innings pitch, the days of rest? Um, uh, and there's several several things to kind of delve into there. But then also you want to know, uh, like we talked about, where is the pain located, but also at what phase of throwing do they have the pain? Um, and uh, is there been any kind of change in their ability to locate their fastball? Uh, have they lost some velocity, some things along those lines? All these things are important to kind of ask in your history, <clears throat> and they can be real helpful uh, with regards to trying to kind of narrow things down. So what is this thing called valgus extension overload? Well, uh, again, as the elbow comes through uh, in a throwing motion, uh, there's stress on the, the medial side of the elbow, there's lateral compression, and there's this forced extension with a, a little bit of a rotatory um, uh, component to it. And, and this is a cartoon um, that shows the anatomy, um, and hopefully my, uh, my mouse will show this. The ulnar collateral ligament being on the medial side receives a lot of stretch. And, and the medial side of the elbow is trying to open up, whereas the lateral side is compressing down on the radial head and the capitellum, and you can get some damage with that. You can also see how the olecranon will abut against the medial side of the olecranon fossa, and that will create some osteophytes and even some loose bodies. Um, and, and there's a lot of damage that can take place at the elbow because of <clears throat> the, the mechanics so valgus extension overload is, is a common uh, phrase that's kind of brought up when you have an athlete or a pitcher who's uh, feeling pain posteriorly in their uh, elbow, maybe medial, maybe lateral, depending on where the damage is taking place. But you can create a lot of damage with the abutment that we talked about. You can get osteophytes and loose bodies, and you can even get a stress fracture. <clears throat> at the olecranon, which uh, in throwers oftentimes means surgery. So the pain is usually produced as, as the elbow goes into full extension, as it kind of snaps into its full extension. Um, uh, and that places that valgus uh, stress. And so if you ask the pitcher when it hurts, it's usually as they're following through and their, and their elbow snaps into full extension. Uh, sometimes they're they're tender along that posterior medial edge of the olecranon as you kind of palpate along there. And the easiest way to get to that area is to bend the, the elbow at about 30 degrees. Um, <clears throat> need to look for other injuries. You can have ulnar collateral ligament injuries that go along with this. Um, and you may, uh, your x-rays may actually give you the answer with some of the osteophytes and the loose bodies and possibly even stress fracture on, on plain x-ray. <clears throat> so what do you do with these folks? <clears throat> um, a lot of times these people, these these athletes, especially the younger folks, can be treated non-operatively with a significant amount of rest. And that's usually the biggest challenge is to get these kids to shut down. Anti-inflammatory medicines or modalities in PT can be helpful. Once they start to feel better, uh, you can uh, maybe look for some of their uh, changes in mechanics. Uh, and then in rehab, you're going to want to try to 
improve the eccentric street strength of the, the, the muscles that flex the elbow. The reason why that's important is because that, that elbow is snapping out into full extension. And if you get the biceps and the brachioradialis to kind of slow down how that snaps into place, then sometimes if you can improve that strength, uh, it can dampen some of the, um, the stress uh, at the elbow. ITP is, a, is an interval throw-in program, and we usually introduce that as symptoms get better. Occasionally, uh, these folks have to have an arthroscopic uh, removal of loose bodies or uh, trimming away of that osteophyte. But uh, I put warning there because uh, there have been times when too much of that osteophyte is removed, and that puts um, increased stress on the ulnar collateral ligament. So it's not terribly unusual to have an athlete who's had an arthroscopic removal of loose bodies and then actually comes back a couple of years later and has to have their ulnar collateral ligament reconstructed. So how do you know if it's going to be uh, a growth plate that's a problem or it's the ligament that's the problem on the medial side of the elbow? Well, the, basically the greatest determining factor is their age and their skeletal maturity. If their medial epicondyle apophysis is still open, then there's a good chance that the apophysis, the physis is actually the weak link in that chain, uh, and they will avulse the bone before they will tear the ligament. Uh, and sometimes that medial epicondyle can still be open even as late as 18 years old or so. So moving into kind of this medial epicondyle avulsion fracture in skeletally immature, um, you can you can a lot of times make the diagnosis almost on the history alone. It's a one time single hard throw where they feel a pop and acute pain, a lot of pain and uh, a lot of swelling and a lot of uh, bruising um, that can can take place with that. And they're focally tender. A lot of times they'll lose some some motion uh, and usually the uh, uh, the radiographs will be real helpful in um, showing you how displaced that medial epicondyle is. And I'll, I'll show you an x-ray just in a minute. Um, as it's true in most kids, if you, if you take an x-ray of both sides, you can kind of get an appreciation for a side-to-side -side difference, which can be real, um, real helpful. So the pronator, uh, the flexor pronator muscle mass is what attaches to that bony prominence of the medial epicondyle, and it pulls that away. Uh, sometimes it can open up just like a, um, uh, a doorway, but oftentimes it not only pulls away, but then it also rotates as well, which you can't really appreciate the rotational deformity uh, on a plain x-ray. And that rotational deformity will affect their, the tension uh, in their ulnar collateral ligament, which is one of the reasons why um, many surgeons who deal with throwers are pretty aggressive about this. So. On the, the, the view of x-ray on the, on the left, you can see the humerus and the radius as well as the ulna with the medial epicondyle uh, located at the arrow. And you can see the difference if, if this is a side-to-side -side comparison, you can see how the medial epicondyle has been pulled away fairly significantly uh, on the x-ray on the right. So it's somewhat controversial as to, you know, when do you operate on these kids? Um, um, and the reason why it's somewhat controversial is in the pediatric literature, it will say it really needs to be at least five millimeters displaced. Uh, but most recommendations from sports surgeons is that you need to be a little bit more aggressive with that and any displacement in an elbow of a dominant, uh, uh, the dominant side of a throwing athlete probably ought to be fixed and um, placed back into position to retention the uh, ulnar collateral ligament. So <clears throat> moving to the ulnar collateral ligament, or some people call the Tommy John ligament because of the surgery that has emerged over the last 25 years. Um, just some anatomy here. Uh, the posterior bundle and the transverse bundle, we just don't really uh, feel like they are really all that important with regards to stability of the elbow in a in the throwing motion. It's really the anterior bundle that takes uh, the majority of the stress. So with an ulnar collateral ligament injury, it can be a little bit better 
different than the medial epicondyle avulsion. Uh, it's going to be uh, medial pain. Oftentimes it's acute, um, but not necessarily. In an older athlete, it oftentimes presents as kind of a subacute, maybe acute on chronic kind of picture. Uh, and it may be as simple as the athlete uh, just doesn't feel like they have uh, control of their of their fastball. They can't locate. Uh, they they can't snap off a, a curveball. Um, uh, but it uh, it can be a kind of one time uh, heard a pop, felt a pop. Uh, but like I said, oftentimes there's a, a history that kind of predates the the uh, the date of injury. So on exam, sometimes there'll be some uh, elbow bruising, but many times it looks pretty normal. Uh, if it's fairly acute, the ulnar nerve, which runs very close to the ulnar collateral ligament, can be uh, involved uh, and irritated, and you get some numbness and tingling down into um, uh, the the ulnar side of the forearm and the and the hand. Um, the exam is real difficult. Um, it's it's difficult to really appreciate instability. Um, and there are some dynamic tests that you can do with that. Uh, ultrasound has been helpful that you can put the uh, the athlete through a dynamic exam with uh, ultrasound on the ligament and you can see the damage uh, if you can stress the ligament uh, using stress views and x-ray. And then, of course, MRI arthrogram is kind of the gold standard. So. <clears throat> This is an X-ray of uh, side by side. Uh, the view on the on the right uh, shows the uh, uh, the pressure that's being put on the lateral side of the elbow, and this this joint is is only opening up about three and a half millimeters. Whereas if you put the uh, pressure on the other uh, elbow, you're seeing that it's opening up about double uh, to uh, over seven millimeters, and and that can be real helpful. Uh, there are not many people that are doing these uh, uh, stress views, but uh, in some centers they still do it. It can be fairly painful for the for the uh, patient, but you do get some good information at times. So um, the MRI, this is an MRI with contrast in the joint. It's called an MRI arthrogram. And um, the image on the left uh, kind of demonstrates at the at the arrow what you would normally appreciate with a ulnar collateral ligament. It's it's very much intact. It kind of widens at the humeral side, uh, this being the distal side and this being the proximal side. Um, the uh, all of the contrast is well contained within the within the joint. Whereas if you come over to the image on the right, uh, you can see how there is a discontinuity of the of the ligament. There's a there's a break in that. Uh, and so you can see that there's some extravasation of the fluid into the soft tissue, and you know that you have a ulnar collateral ligament tear by MRI arthrogram. Um, so there are partial undersurface tears uh, where uh, the uh, external layer is intact, uh, but it's peeled away from the uh, from the the bone, and uh, you can diagnose that best with contrast in the uh, with the MRI. Uh, and that's the reason why many places uh, are going to use contrasted studies. And you're looking for something called the T sign. Uh, so an MRI with uh, with an intact ligament, it holds the it holds the fluid in the joint, uh, and you get kind of this look. But if the if the ligament has pulled away from the periosteum uh, on the uh, uh, distal side, then you see how the the contrast will actually come down and it looks like a T on its side. Um, it's also been called a tau sign. Um, it kind of looks like maybe the Greek letter T on its side. Uh, nonetheless, you see how the fluid kind of extravasates down and that, that can be a partial tear, which is a subtle finding. So if it's a, if, if it's a, um, a fairly mild uh, sprain to the ligament, uh, oftentimes we'll use non-operative treatments. It's certainly the first line. And if it's fairly mild, um, six to eight weeks of rest, if, if it uh, seems to be a fairly significant injury, then uh, you may be putting these folks on a shelf for, you know, three or four months. Um, rehab is important. 
you start out with core and uh, some um, uh, uh, conditioning and that sort of thing, and then you progress uh, to therapy that would uh, be specific to the elbow or the shoulder. Um, and as things improve and based on time and your sense of severity, uh, then again, we kind of move to that interval throwing program uh, where you can slowly progress them back to uh, some gentle throwing followed by some long toss and then some stuff off the mound once they reach that point in their rehab. Surgical treatment, um, mostly for full thickness tears or partial tears. If you've tried conservative treatment and the, the athlete just can't get back to their level of, um, of throwing, they remain symptomatic somehow some way, maybe that's just their performance, but it oftentimes is, is pain that pre prevent, prevents them from being able to perform at their top level. Um, most of the literature that's coming out of centers where they do a lot of these reconstruction techniques is 80 to 85% success rate. And that's getting that athlete back to the same level that they were before they were injured or uh, higher, they were able to progress uh, maybe from AAA to the big leagues or, or they were in high school before and they were able to move to a college career. Now, there's a kind of cutting edge information. As far as I know, there's only been one major league player recently who's had an ulnar collateral ligament repair. Um, when Dr. Job uh, started this uh, with reconstruction with uh, Tommy John. Um, there were a few attempts to do repairs and they were really met with poor results. And so really it got abandoned. But recently there's been a lot of interest in it because um, it's a less invasive surgery with a quicker return to play. Um, and so far, if you stratify a, uh, a repair, to maybe a younger thrower with less um, wear and tear on the tissue and a healthier tissue and a more acute tear, um, I think the uh, results may be promising. And there are a couple of centers that are they're really looking and trying to stratify uh, certain athletes uh, to do these repairs on. Um, and so stay tuned for that because that may be kind of one of the next big thing that comes out about ulnar collateral ligament uh, surgery. So what about the shoulder? Well, certainly the, the throwing athlete is prone to injuries in the shoulder because of that uh, uh, high revolution that we talked about, the real, the, the unbelievable speed of internal rotation of the shoulder at the release of the ball. And uh, many times it's, it's due to improper mechanics, but it's, it's mostly due to overuse, um, even if the mechanics are good. Um, can be a single event, but more times than not, especially with the older uh, athlete, it's an overuse, maybe over an entire career. Um, and it's damage to the dynamic stabilizers and the static stabilizers. So if you think about the shoulder, dynamically, the ball stays in the socket because the muscles are working um, together to try to hold the ball in the socket. And that's the rotator cuff, the muscles that um, help uh, put the, uh, keep the shoulder blade in place on the, on the back um, and stabilize the scapula. Also the long head of the biceps uh, and its attachment to the labrum uh, in the, in the, in the joint. Uh, and then the static stabilizers are the bony anatomy, the ball and socket itself, the labrum, which is that uh, rim of cartilage that makes the cup a little bit deeper. And then the, the, the tissue that goes around uh, the whole joint, which is called the capsule. Uh, all of these things help to kind of stabilize the joint as it goes through this range of motion. Um, so this is just a list of all the possibilities that can be going on in the shoulder of, a, of an athlete who's throwing. And some of those are kind of extrinsic or outside the joint, like the rotator cuff, uh, you get some external or subacromial uh, impingement. Uh, you get some dysfunction with the scapula. Those all can play a role in shoulder pain, and they're all outside the joint. Um, the intrinsic, which is kind of the bones and the labrum, um, can can tear, uh, can develop uh, osteochondritis desiccans, 
or sometimes with instability, you'll actually chip some bone off, which is called a bony bank heart. Uh, you can also have some of the more rare instances uh, where you can get thoracic outlet. Uh, you can also get um, uh, a thrombotic uh, uh, phenomena uh, because of throwing where uh, the compression of the vein creates a, uh, a thrombosis in the vein. And, and uh, so neurovascularly, there are some things that can take place that can give you some pain in a thrower's shoulder. So internal impingement, we talked a little bit about the external causes and the most one of the most common things that you're going to see in a thrower is external impingement, where there's impingement of the rotator cuff uh, just deep to the acromion uh, in the subacromial space. Um, but one injury that is fairly unique to throwers is something called internal impingement. And this is this is more posterior uh, in the shoulder. Uh, it's a it's a deep kind of ache in the posterior shoulder where uh, the humeral head will pinch the supraspinatus tendon right at the, the glenoid rim of the uh, scapula. It's first described back in 1992, so a fairly recent uh, injury, but as you can imagine with this severely externally rotated shoulder, uh, there's a lot of compressive damage that can take place and some fraying and partial tearing even of the cuff and the labrum. Um, and it's it can be closely related to some relative instability of the joint anteriorly that would allow the 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 uh, humeral head or the ball that sits in the socket to kind of rotate posteriorly and uh, and create some damage back in the back of the shoulder. And the 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 uh, the thrower will come in and complain or report pain when he's in that deep cocking phase when he's fully externally rotated and all of his pain is is usually posteriorly. Um, through an exam, a lot of times you can find some anterior laxity and it's reproducible on exam if you lay the patient down and you allow them to move their hand very far back in an externally rotated position while their arm is, is fully abducted, basically in the position that they would be pitching and uh, cocking fully back to get ready to throw the ball and they'll have pain localized uh, posteriorly. So is there some sort of um, protection uh, that young throwers get with uh, development of their humeral head? And it, uh, the, the answer to that is we think so, uh, and it's called humeral head retroversion. Uh, and as the, the bone is still growing, if you're a thrower, then oftentimes we see that the, um, the humeral head will actually retrovert in such a way that it will allow um, these throwers to be able to get further back in external rotation. Now, oftentimes they do that at the expense of being able to internally rotate uh, their shoulder. But Kevin Wilk, who's a, um, a colleague of mine when I was in Birmingham, he's a physical therapist, has done a lot of work in this area. And, uh, really doesn't feel like this loss of internal rotation as long as there is increased external rotation is any kind of big problem at all. Um, but due to these uh, uh, bony adaptations, uh, there is some retroversion of the, uh, of the humeral head that can be seen if you do x-rays on, on, uh, on these folks, you, you see an adaptive change that takes place. So that kind of moves us into a, a topic of little league shoulder, which is a uh, I find very interesting and, and I see a lot of it. Um, and it's not real satisfying, uh, to be honest with you, uh, because there's lots of lots of things about little league or shoulder that we don't fully understand. Um, the technical term would be proximal humeral epiphysiolysis, and it's it's a widening of that proximal growth plate uh, on the humerus. It was first described quite a while ago. Um, and usually the way these kids will present is their shoulder pain is, is, is only taking place when they're throwing a baseball. Uh, they don't really have pain with anything else in their lives. And a lot of times it's at the end of a, a long season where they've done a, a lot of throwing. And almost without exception, the exam is benign. There's really not much you can find. Occasionally, they'll be tender over the growth plate, 
Uh, occasionally they'll have some pain when you try to resist their external rotation. Many times the x-ray um, will demonstrate some widening of the, uh, of the uh, epiphysis. Um, and usually the advice is rest, uh, but there's a lot of different opinions on how much to rest uh, and how long to discontinue the, the pitching. Some people would say several weeks and other people would say uh, you really need to wait until the following year before you start uh, trying to pitch again. It just it really just depends on um, who you talk to or who you're reading. So the biomechanics of all this is that the rotator cuff attaches proximal to the growth plate. And some of the other muscles like the pecs and the deltoid and the triceps are all uh, attaching distally. And as these athletes put their arm through this throwing motion, uh, there's, a, a, there's an internal rotation that takes place uh, as their arm is adducted, but there's also an externally rotated component um, and it, in the in the abducted position, and so it's almost like the it's almost like a lid on a jar. You're kind of uh, rotating two things in two different directions at the same time, and and with uh, the growth plate being kind of again the weak link in the in the whole chain, um, there's some widening there, there's some twisting, there's some injury, if you will, to the uh, proximal uh, physis in the humerus. Um, and that creates pain and sometimes radiographic changes. So this is a um, this is a view. And again, if you're taking care of kids, you're talking about growth plates. You're almost always going to uh, take a, an X-ray of the opposite side. Um, and in this case, this is a right-handed thrower, and uh, you can see how here uh, laterally uh, there's some widening of his physis as compared to what you see over on the on the left, the non-dominant, the non-throwing side. And so oftentimes we look at that and we can say to mom or dad, hey, your child has got some widening here and they really need to shut down. Um, but that's not real satisfying when you really kind of start to think about it, because is that widening the cause of their pain uh, or is that a natural result, result of throwing? We talked about the retro version that we see as a a physiologic, bony physiologic change that happens uh, with many throwers. And is that what's going on here? Uh, and we're just catching uh, this widening, this uh, this um, mutation, if you will, uh, taking place. Um, and so is it really pathologic or is it physiologic? And and, and let's say it, it is pathologic. Well, what's the optimal amount of rest prior to returning an athlete to throwing? Because tell these 13 year old boys that they can't pitch for three, four, six months or till next season is pretty devastating when that's their main sport. Um, so studies have looked and, and found that there, if you, if you take x-rays of kids who are throwing baseballs a lot, there's a statistically significant difference in the width of their growth plates on the dominant versus the non-dominant side. So is that clinically significant when you're looking at one of these athletes? Basically, the treatment is rest. Um, you can allow them to do non-painful things, um, especially to begin with. It's usually physical therapy that if they can do that pain free uh, and then you progress them again to the uh, interval throwing program. But you try to keep them away from doing a lot of uh, work with their arm early on and uh, do some endurance training, some core training, uh, try to keep them busy, try to keep them distracted, quite frankly, until their arm is ready for the rehab and then ultimately an interval throwing program. But when it's all said and done, you're looking at probably about four months uh, before they're back to play. So just a word on imaging. Um, in my line of work, I see an awful lot of people who see athletes, uh, throwers who have pain, um, uh, maybe the uh, the practitioner is not really all that comfortable with at, uh, throwing athletes, not real confident in their their uh, exam. So an MRI gets uh, ordered an awful lot of time. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, James Andrews, uh, used to say all the time, if you want an excuse to operate on a throwing shoulder, get an MRI because 
Um, it's just a matter of time before these MRIs show a lot of degenerative change from this um, uh, stressful activity that it's involved in. But what we see on an MRI is not always pathologic. And many times in the shoulder, um, there's more than one thing going on. And, and that's what makes, uh, makes kind of figuring these folks out a little bit difficult. Um, I'm going to spend the, the last bit of the talk just talking about uh, prevention. Uh, and so why do we need prevention? Well, what's the, what's the scope of the issue? And if you look at um, most studies would, you know, that take a big cohort like this one that took almost 500 athletes, 24 of them ended up with a serious uh, elbow or shoulder injury by the time they were 20 years old. Now, is that an epidemic? Well, probably not, uh, unless you're the one that's affected by it, whether, you know, it's your child or it's you individually. Um, but it's really, it makes it difficult to study uh, because it is a small, a relatively small number to, to, to study. Um, so how did we kind of get started with making recommendations on, you know, what to what to tell these families and what to tell these kids? Um, if you look back in the literature, it, it really kind of, I think, started with uh, the Lyman study in 2002, where they they looked at pitch type, pitch count, mechanics. Uh, and try to kind of determine what were the risks uh, for uh, injuries at the elbow and the shoulder. And it was a pretty incredible study because they they surveyed uh, almost 500 youth pitchers and they called them uh, on the day after they, they pitched and uh, went through this short questionnaire with them about pitch counts and, and pain and uh, uh, several different things. And it was uh, quite a study. Uh, to try to tease out, okay, what are some of the risk factors? And it was pretty obvious uh, pretty early on that the risk of pain in the shoulder uh, was was due to the number of pitches. Uh, and so, you know, as you as you uh, as you get up to fifty to seventy five pitches, your risk is going up. And 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 when you get to hundred plus, it it really makes a big difference, especially in the shoulder. And then if you, you look at the number of uh, games pitched in the season, uh, there started to be more pain uh, the further you got into the season and the number of games, uh, the number of innings, uh, the number of pitches uh, that, that are beginning to stack up. And when you, when you throw 800 pitches or more in a season, uh, then things tend to start breaking down. A lot of this is intuitive, uh, but we didn't have the data to show it. Um, anybody that's taking care of athletes needs to read Sam Olson's study in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2006, which really um, was a was a great study where uh, he looked at a number of uh, baseball players that had had injuries versus those who had not uh, and really tried to tease out what were the habits that kept the healthy pitchers healthy and uh, found that it was uh, four times more likely if you if you had a game where you pitched greater than 80 pitches, uh, you were four times more likely to have a surgery on your shoulder or your elbow. Uh, if you threw for more than eight months out of the year, it was five times. But the real thing that really came out of the study is if you allow these young throwers to throw with a tired arm, a dead arm, or a painful arm, it's 36 times more likely that that individual is going to end up um, under the knife. So another thing to look at is proper mechanics. Sometimes uh, uh, improper mechanics are going to decrease the velocity of the ball, and all of them, all these players are interested in what is their velocity. Um, but uh, you also look at mechanics can really increase uh, the amount of force and torque uh, across the shoulder and the elbow. Um, so asking questions about uh, their mechanics as well as are they playing in multiple leagues? And many of these guys are. Um, uh, they're pitching in more than one league at a time, and they may be okay within the limits of each league, but cumulatively as an individual, they are way outside of the limit. Um, and then similarly, you have some overlapping seasons where you're moving from your elite league to your high school team and you're you're playing for two teams or your travel ball and rec ball. Uh, there's a lot of times where there's more than one uh, one team that the kid is playing for. And uh, the number of pitches and the lack of days of rest can really stack up against them. 
So through some of this, uh, some of these studies and some of the information that uh, comes out of different places like the American Sports Medicine Institute, USA Baseball, Little League Baseball, there's some recommendations that have been made over the years with regards to breaking pitches and showcases and year-round baseball, uh, some pitch counts and some days of rest for particularly ages 9 through 14, but most emphasize good mechanics and, uh, you know, good conditioning. Uh, Little League Baseball uh, uh, produced this document where they, they based on the age, uh, they recommended the maximum number of pitches per game. Um, and then uh, American Sports Medicine Institute in 2009 kind of put together a lot of this and uh, came out with their position statement. And of course, based on uh, Sam Olson's study, the first thing is to watch and respond to signs of fatigue or pain uh, with a throwing shoulder. Um, really recommended that at, you know, preferably four months, there's no repetitive throwing. Uh, and then really follow the pitch counts and the days of rest. Uh, don't overlap or pitch on multiple teams. If they're going to play on multiple teams, just pitch for one. Uh, and then emphasizing good mechanics, uh, starting with some basic throwing and then fastball and, and then change up uh, and then finally move into some kind of breaking ball later on. Uh, if you've got a kid who knows what he throws on the radar, that's a bad sign. Uh, and then they also recommended that uh, you avoid um, moving from pitcher to catcher or catcher to pitcher in the same game or even the same weekend. Um, if there is pain and it's persistent, you need to see a, a sports position. Um, really wanting to inspire fun, uh, inspire young pitchers to be athletic and just participate and enjoy it. Uh, develop uh, your athleticism and your interest. And, and some of the other stuff just kind of comes along. So until 2011, we didn't really have a whole lot of information that would really say that these pitch counts were really preventing injury. But uh, some colleagues of mine at UNC working with uh, a Little League Baseball were actually very definitively able to show in 2011 in the study that they did that uh, mandatory pitch counts are key to injury prevention. Uh, and should be continued and even strengthening, strengthened uh, in Little League Baseball and some of the other uh, leagues that are out there. Um, and, and so uh, we, we do have some evidence that shows that. Now, what about breaking balls? Well, in Sam Olson's study, he looked at pitchers from 14 to 20, and 66 of them had had elbow surgery, 29 of them had had shoulder surgery, and comparing that to 45 healthy folks that uh, had not had any problems with their shoulder. He really didn't see any difference with regards to age in those that were injured and uninjured uh, when they began to throw a, a breaking ball. And then he also looked at, you know, how long had they um, uh, gone through puberty as well. And, and really there wasn't a whole lot of difference uh, in those uh, that were throwing breaking balls um, between the injured and not injured. Previously, uh, it had been recommended don't let your child throw a breaking ball until he's um, until he's shaving. And Sam's study showed uh, really that's that's not uh, not much to worry about. So, does it predispose young throwers to injury? And the answer, you know, really ought to be in the biomechanical studies to look at the stress across the elbow. And so, this is a young thrower. Actually, uh, this is a picture of. Uh, my son, who's now a 20-year-old college soccer player, but this is when he was playing uh, uh, youth baseball uh, and some of the stresses that are uh, coming across his elbow and his shoulder. And if you if you take these, uh, oh, did I lose my slides? All right. Not sure what happened to the last few slides. Uh, you guys bear with me here just a minute. We'll see if we can find these last few slides. We're almost done and ready to take questions. So if you got some questions, um, be prepared. 
Hey, Dr. Ray, it looks like um, I can see some of these slides we here. Go. We got yeah. it back. Good. Okay. Thank you, Trent. Yeah, no problem. All right. Good. So the studies that were done looking at these youth baseball players actually showed that the stress across the elbow and the torque that is created is less in a curveball than it is in a fastball. Uh, three different studies uh, that were produced that 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 basically showed that. Um, so the fastball is probably more dangerous to the elbow than the than the curveball. So some new recommendations have come out that basically say we really do need to stick to the pitch counts and the days of rest that have been recommended, but maybe we could lighten up a little bit on the curveball dogma. And uh, another thing that has been shown uh, recently is that the bigger, the stronger the kid, the faster he throws, the more likely he is to get an injury. So instead of those kids pitching more, they should probably be the kids that pitch less. So now the pitch counts are, are kind of uh, falling into these categories with regards to age, uh, depending on uh, your daily max in a game, but also if you uh, well, if you look down there, if you pitch 30 pitches as an 18 year old, uh, you really ought to give that, you know, a full day, a full day of rest uh, before you pitch again. Uh, and um, there are recommendations there on maximums as well as what you um, what you should expect a, an athlete to be able to do uh, on their next outing. Um, and with that, I will complete. Uh, these are my kids who are much older now, but uh, uh, just before we decided to move to Duke. Um, with that, I will remove this and um, am willing to take some questions if Trent will help me do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, uh, you guys can go into the Q&A section on the side there and just uh, type in your questions and I'll read them out loud and have Dr. Ray answer them. And thank you again, Dr. Ray. That was a that was a great talk. Thank you for agreeing to uh, come and um, present with us today. Yeah, glad to do it. Um, I have a quick, quick question for you, Dr. Ray. So right. I know a lot of what you talked about has been studied in uh, baseball players, but you know, maybe anecdotally, have you ever seen uh, like the UCL injuries or these overuse injuries in other athletes, you know, like maybe volleyball players or quarterbacks in football or any other athletes that are doing kind of that overhead quick internal rotation motion? Rarely. Okay. Um, even in baseball, we see it sometimes in catchers would be, you know, kind of a, a very distant second. Um Occasionally, you see a position player that 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 uh, has to have this this surgery done, um, but it's it's not unusual in in uh, javelin. There just aren't that many javelin throwers out there. So if you compare the number of javelin throwers to the number of people that are playing baseball, it it makes it very rare to you know run into a javelin thrower. Uh, but that throw is somewhat similar to the baseball. It's um, it's extremely rare with throwing a football. The mechanics are different enough with throwing a football. Um, the only quarterbacks that I've seen are quarterbacks who are also baseball players. Um, uh, I'm sure there are probably some that are out there that have had to have it done. Uh, uh, I have seen one that was not a baseball player, but it was a traumatic injury. Uh, he came, he, he followed through and hit his arm on, um, uh, on another player's, uh, either shoulder or helmet. And it, it forced his arm into such a valgus that it, that it tore his ligament. So just the, the mechanics of throwing a football are so different that you don't really get that same stress across the ulnar collateral ligament like you do with a baseball th throw. It's a good okay. question though. It happens. And, and we see ulnar collateral ligament tears. 
uh, in a lot of folks. Um, gymnasts will tear their ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, uh, older individuals that dislocate their, their elbow, oftentimes, even if you're not older, you oftentimes tear your ulnar collateral ligament. Wrestling, for instance, it's very common. But you don't really need your ulnar collateral ligament to do anything but throw 90 mile an hour fastballs. So you can let that ligament heal after a dislocated elbow and it does fine for even something like wrestling. So uh, it really is just that that repetitive mechanical stress. Uh, that's really interesting. How about um, like outfield or um, any other position player in baseball, or is it just mostly the pitchers and the catchers? It's mostly pitchers and catchers. Um, occasionally, um, you'll see a, a one-time event where somebody does throw. I had a 14-year-old that was in my office this week who avulsed his um, medial epicondyle. Uh, and he got surgery uh, before the week was over because he pulled it away. Um, and so that that one time kind of pop, a lot of swelling, it's, it's usually more of a young athlete who does that, whereas uh, the older athletes, even if it is an outfielder, will usually have a prodrome of sorts uh, where they're kind of having pain, they're kind of not getting as much velocity, they're kind of not as accurate, and then it just gets too painful for them to continue. Um, and we do see that in position players. It's just not nearly as often. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was um, really interesting about the uh, the recent studies on throwing curveballs. I know when I was growing up, that was always the big thing. Like you said, that was the dogma, right? Not to throw curveballs too early. Um, have you seen a change in attitude towards that? Or are we still lagging pretty far behind? Well, I, I think I think that the message is that you have to limit the volume of throwing, that um, your mechanics have got to be good, uh, no doubt. And so if you have a kid who's trying to throw a curveball and he's trying to throw it the wrong way, then he may right. be putting some stress across that elbow that he does. We didn't see in the biomechanical studies. Hmm. Um, so the mechanics have to be good. But if the mechanics are good, then we, we I think we've put it to rest that you you don't put nearly as much stress across the the structures especially the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament with a curveball as much as you do with a fastball so um it, it is interesting because it was it's fairly dogmatic and pretty ingrained and i, I think in in time the the message is is going to be that um you just have to cut down on the amount of volume that these kids are throwing uh, and so pitch counts and days of rest and um, limiting number of leagues and things along those lines are, is, is really where the prevention is going to be. Um, I, I know a lot of kind of the discussion, in kind of the sports medicine community has been uh, the special specialization of young athletes, you know, kind of leading to these overuse injuries. Have you kind of seen an increase in incidents in these injuries in the past couple of years, um, maybe due to specialization? Yeah, so my colleagues in Birmingham have been looking at, um, at the numbers uh, for probably close to 15 years. And oh, wow. each each year, it, it definitely goes up. Uh, Lyle Kane is a colleague of mine who has a registry, uh, and he can show. Um, uh, and, and so you get some articles in the lay press that call it an epidemic and, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, and, and some of it is we didn't used to have an answer for an ulnar collateral ligament tear. Uh, and so those people who previously would have just kind of given up the sport, are now seeking out ways to continue. Uh, we recognize it a little bit more, so we're making the diagnosis more quickly and, and better. Um, but I also think there absolutely is a component with what you're, what you're pointing out, and that is that um, it's a lot of overuse. It's a lot of specialization. These kids are not taking a four-month break from throwing. Um, and their tissues are just breaking down. Dr. Andrews oftentimes would say that the reason why he's doing an ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction on a 22-year-old who's at the 
um, you know, double A uh, professional level is because somebody's dad overthrew him when he was 15 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, it, it takes that long to kind of see the result of the breakdown that took place a long, long time ago. So it really is volume. It really is. Um, it really is too bad that uh, kids can't involve themselves in a lot of different sports and be more athletic. I, uh, I think we've kind of emphasized that. Okay. Um, do you know if there's ever been any evidence to suggest like a prophylactic physical therapy or like strengthening of the muscles that support these joints um, could also, you know, help prevent these injuries, especially in athletes that are, you know, don't really have a choice, like your high level athletes, but to specialize. I don't, I don't know of any study that has shown that. I mean, I think intuitively, if you, if you have a strong core, um, if you are uh, in good shape, uh, you know, kind of from the core out, uh, if you, if you have a good uh, shoulder shoulder girdle, then you're less likely to put stress across your elbows. So a lot of it is intuitive. I don't know of a study that has looked at, you know, kind of like what we do with ACL prevention. Can you do a, can you do an ulnar collateral ligament prevention? Uh, I don't know of anything that's, that's looked at that. Um, I mean, it makes sense that the kids that are in better shape are more likely to be able to kind of protect themselves, but uh, don't know that we can prove that. Okay. Oh, looks like we have a question here. Uh, so from James. So, hey, Dr. Ray, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I have a question regarding primary care sports medicine in general. What would you recommend medical students become involved with uh, community service, research coverage, et cetera, uh, in order to start on the track towards primary care sports medicine? That's a great question. I get that all the time. Uh, we just had our first meeting of the year with our interest group, and that's what we spent the entire time talking about. Um, uh, for me, as a fellowship director, I'm looking uh, for an enthusiasm that has kind of been there longitudinally. So uh, coming outside of your normal rotations, out of your normal curriculum, and uh, volunteering to do things in uh whether that's coverage, uh, depending on, you know, where you are in your training. Um, but you can volunteer for, uh, you know, to help at the tent at the marathon that's in your town. Um, you can uh, try to seek out some faculty who are doing some research. Those are the kind of things that, that I'm really looking for in an application is, is um, how available did the applicant make themselves to the sports medicine community that was already out there you know, find find a, a a team physician that's going out to a high school game or covering a soccer tournament or or whatever. Just get your feet wet and uh, and dig in. Um, whether that's you know shadowing somebody in clinic or or being out on the sideline or or finding a research project. To me, that means more than anything else that there's just a hunger and an enthusiasm to learn uh, and to be involved. Um, I mean, I look at I look at uh, uh, test scores and I look at uh, things like that. Um, uh, but what really ri- allows people to kind of rise to the top is is just what we were just talking about, just being involved. Thank you, and thank you, James, for the question. Yep. Um, All right. Well, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, Dr. Ray, I just wanted to thank you again for uh, taking this time on a Thursday night to talk to us. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation. I'm you know, sure from the student level to the attending level it was very useful. So thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And the, uh, the, you know, the medical student interest group really thanks you. Well, it was enjoyable. We'll do it again sometime. Thanks a lot. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Ray. All right. Take care. care. All right. Good night. Thank you, everyone.